Having been in this industry for more than 10 years, there are several points in that timeline that I can hang my hat on a hook and say, I affected change. First one of those was MSI's rotating button overclock feature. I changed it from being an absolute mess into something that's slightly usable. Second, AMD's Threadripper 3990X. I actually set the price for that after the initial price. I said, that's just wrong. We need to change it. $39.90, $1 per X, that's great. And now for the third time, something that I didn't think was even possible. I've helped name a supercomputer. If you're interested in some good merch, then head to merch.techtechpotato.com. So a lot of the regular audience will know that my day job today is as an analyst. I have clients in the industry who I help with their marketing, with their messaging and message testing. Some of my clients include IBM, AMD, Intel, Tens Torrent, Qualcomm, and I've got a few others who also work with on sponsored videos. Now, the supercomputer I've helped name is one by IBM. Now, IBM has a history with supercomputers. They've had Summit and Sierra, who were number one and number two in 2018-2019 on the top 500 supercomputer list. The machine that they've announced this month is called Vela. That's Vela. And it's an interesting story about how that name came about, or at least from my side of the things. So when I say help name a supercomputer, what happened is IBM said, we're going to announce this supercomputer, and as one of my clients, we want to tell you about it in advance. Same thing like with a press and a pre-briefing. And they said, here's our new AI supercomputer. It's going to be focused on AI. It's going to be cloud. It's going to be a supercomputer, but for the cloud. So it's going to have cloud trimmings, but still be very supercomputer-like. It's got a ton of GPUs, and we'll get into the specifications in a second. And I turned around and said, does your supercomputer have a name? And they said, no. And I said, it should have a name. Big systems like this, even in the cloud, from the HPC audience, every big supercomputer has a name, either where it's based or named off of a mountain range or a star. And in this case, they said, no, we didn't have a name. And I said, well, before this comes to, to the media, to the public, it needs to have a name. And it also makes it very easy to reference to. And then, okay, we'll have a think about it. And then two days before the announcement, they got, got back to me and said, we're going to call it this. And I said, you shouldn't call it that because that's the name of a product that didn't fare too well in the market, in the consumer market. And they're like, hmm. And then a couple of days later on the launch, they told me the final name, Vela, uh, and it kind of works, right? Supercomputers are all about speed, Vela, Velo, Velocity, speed. So I think it kind of works. And so while I didn't pick the exact name, I actually essentially argued for the, its existence in the first place and stopped it from being something that could have been quite negative. But yeah, IBM has history with supercomputers, at least supplying them externally to uh, the DOE and uh, all the national labs. This one, Vela, is used for their internal workflows right now. So it's an AI supercomputer. What does that mean? It is built from Cascade Lake CPUs, NVIDIA A100 GPUs. So what they're doing is they're using the DGX, HGX supercomputers um, that NVIDIA like to promote. On top of that, you've got memory and storage. And while they're not saying exact numbers on how big it is, it looks like it's at least 200 nodes. So it's 200 times by eight, so at least 1600 GPUs. It's currently for use for IBM research. Now, for those not familiar, uh, with IBM, they obviously have multiple different departments and research is one of the biggest. And if you've seen some of my videos recently with Dr. Talia Gershon about the state of foundation models and full stack solutions in AI, this supercomputer is based on to help those parts of the business. So it's still an internal supercomputer. A lot of the supercomputers on the top 500 list, for example, are uh, company owned for internal workflow. Uh, but it's uh, an AI computer for the cloud. So any, any part of IBM research or any partner of IBM research can take time on this supercomputer using cloud resources. Now, using a supercomputer in the cloud isn't necessarily a new thing, but it's not something that's really taken off. 
So the problem with cloud resources is that if you imagine AWS, Azure, Google, you have to be able to su support multiple clients at once through a singular interface and they can spin up containers, they can spin up instances. With a supercomputer, that's usually not always the case. You will have multiple people who want time on the supercomputer and you may partition, say, well, that user gets half, this user gets you know, 10 racks or what have you. But it's all done through a workload management system. It's not done in the cloud because typically those systems rely on bare metal performance. IBM is saying that through their full stack solution, so using a combination of Red Hat, OpenShift, and then built on software like Ray and PyTorch, they are able to only get sort of a 5% difference on a single node using a cloud-based system for an AI supercomputer rather than just a bare metal system for an AI supercomputer. So that's really interesting. We know that, for example, Azure has uh, in-house you know, effective supercomputers for AI with various bits of hardware. However, they're not really promoted in the same way. And like I say, the, the concept of an AI, a cloud supercomputer hasn't really taken off in that fashion. It's just been cloud resources. Part of the issue there is, for example, if you want say three or four instances across a data center, you don't necessarily know where they are in the networking topology. And therefore your software has to dynamically on the fly determine what the latency is between those two points. IBM's setup is that they're just housing everything in one data center and everything is at least two hops away. So it's standard top of rack switch and uh, you know leaf spine topology. So they're aiming for just simply a two hop to any other system. The other thing that's different in this system is that they're using ethernet. So normally DGX, HGX systems with Intel and Nvidia and those A100s are built with InfiniBand. Uh, but in this instance, IBM has decided to go with Ethernet. And Ethernet isn't usually used because there's a, you know, additional latencies and overhead and what have you. Um, and the idea was when you've got a big AI supercomputer and you need hundreds of GPUs, latency between the GPUs and between one system to another is actually really important as well as the bandwidth. So you try and use the lowest latency, the highest bandwidth uh, possible system. But in, in this instance, uh, IBM has decided to use Ethernet, which is a cost down solution, but they're saying that with that, they're even they're getting 90% scaling on their AI workloads. AI algorithms right now, especially transformer networks, often have synchronization points in their calculations, something that is typically called like a map reduce or an all reduce. And it's a reduction. It's the idea of all the elements in the system have to come together to converge on one point before being essentially distributed work again. This is a limiting factor because if you've got one part of the system that's running slower, you're limited by that slowest point and then you're also limited by the networking into that all reduce. IBM is saying here that on their software stack, again, Red Hat, OpenShift, Ray and PyTorch, they're doing what's called a fully sharded data parallel profile with their AI workloads. This means that you can do that all reduce or that map reduce asynchronously across the network. So you're not relying on the latency of something else to catch up before you're able to do more work. Doing that, that means that they can scale up to sort of this 90% efficiency. Um, and I believe the data goes anywhere from like 16 to 32 to 128 GPUs of, of what they're testing here. So regarding the hardware, you're probably thinking Cascade Lake and A100s, that's not anything special. Why is this even being announced? Well, it's actually been in use since May 2022. It's only now that they're announcing it because they're opening it up to IBM Cloud partners, not just for IBM research internal use case. So if you've seen my video on the four pillars of IBM's AI hardware center, one of them is test beds. And this is an example of one of their testbed situations. You may have also seen the video I've done about their artificial intelligence unit, which is their own custom silicon for you know, lower precision AI workflows. That is also going to be integrated into a, into a situation kind of like this, into an AI-based cloud supercomputer. So it's getting partners on board familiar with the cloud systems and familiar in the supercomputing context in how all of this is being networked together. 
So it's being announced because of those uh, next steps in the sort of production life cycle of this supercomputer and how it's going to be integrated into the future. And right now, what is it used for? Well, I've done a video on foundation models with Talia, as I said earlier. And the whole point about this is when they're engaging with customers, IBM is looking at foundation models as a service. Now, recent news, chat GPT, foundation models are gonna be a key thing moving forward. Foundation models such as uh, large uh, language models require tons and tons of data in order to be able to come in and do the training. However, realistically, this costs a lot. And the number of people who, are, who actually have the facilities to do large language model um, training and these foundation model trainings are few and far between. I mean, we're talking about half a dozen, a dozen re realistically. In order to facilitate IBM's customer base who are interested in uh, creating either their own large language models or their large foundational models, or even fine tuning others, IBM here is trying to offer foundation models as a service. So that's using IBM's data set and IBM's hardware to help train those individual models as and what the customer requires. Now, obviously you build the tools and the customer might use it for something completely different to what you originally intended. IBM's goal here is software stack, data set, tools. So whatever their customer wants to do with it, there's a facility in which they can do that. Uh, my involvement here, well, it's just the name, but that's a pretty good thing to have on the CV, right?